As we look at, at Romans this week, um, we're actually going to move into one of the more difficult sections. We started that difficult section today, um, and then it's, uh, it's going to get better from there. Remember with Romans, the basic outline. Uh, Paul's basic theme in Romans is the righteousness of God. Um, the word righteous in one form or another, you've seen that word popping up quite a bit here. It's used over 40 times in, the, in these 16 chapters of Romans. Chapters 1 through 3, he presented the need for righteousness. In 3 through 8, he presented God's provision, or the provision of righteousness in Christ Jesus. So what we read last week was some really rough stuff in chapter 7, and then the glorious beauty of chapter 8, where we see how Christ is the perfect provision for our sin, and how through Christ we have hope, through Christ we have life. And what we're going to read this week, the tough stuff, is in 9 through 11, and that is, is on Israel and how Israel rejected God's righteousness. And then we get into the, uh, the practical piece, which is chapters 12 through 16, and how righteousness must be lived out in daily practice. As we look at this, um, this overarching uh, theme of righteousness, the uh, chapters 9 through 11 are probably some of the most difficult chapters in, in Romans. Um, and they're difficult because Paul seems to be going back and forth as to what, what's going to happen to the Jews. He opens up chapter 9, and I read this passage this morning, with a very heart-wrenching cry. He says, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. So in other words, I really want you to pay attention here. I'm telling the truth. This is serious. <clears throat> My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my brothers and sisters. Recognize the pain that he feels about what he's about to tell us. I would be willing to be forever cursed Cut off from Christ if that would save them. Now, I mentioned this in, in my concluding remarks this morning after Larry had spoken to us. Paul had so much passion for the gospel to be spread. He had so much love for the Jewish people. He was willing, personally, to pay the price of being cut off from Christ. Now remember what Paul has told us. In Philippians, Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says in Philippians that I count absolutely everything else in my life as rubbish compared to the surpassing joy of knowing Christ. And yet he says here in Romans that he would personally give up everything if it would save the Jews. He would be cut off from Christ. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? You can see in that statement, because remember what Paul has gone through before he writes this letter. Paul has gone through so many beatings, imprisonments, shipwrecks, robberies. Paul has gone through so much... Yeah, that's in in Second Colossians, right? Yes. Yeah. Chapter eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell you? <laughs> we were we were talking through her lesson last night, and I was telling her, um, and somehow she got current Colossians written down instead of Corinthians. Um, anyway, um, as you as we recognize all that Paul has gone through, the the sustaining factor for him in all that he has gone through, and the reason that he has gone through all of that was his love and relationship with Jesus Christ. For him to say that he would be willing to be cut off is absolutely mind-blowing. There was a, a little brother and sister, and the little sister had, uh, had cancer, and she needed a, a bone marrow transplant. And her brother was a match. Her brother was young, but was the only match they could find. 
And they asked the, the little boy if he would be willing so that his sister could live. He thought about it for a while, and then he finally said yes. The day of the procedure, they went in and they hooked up the IVs to get things started. And the little boy teared up and he said, is this when I start to die? You see, he had misunderstood and he thought that by his doing this donation that it was going to kill him so that his sister could live. This little boy was willing to make that sacrifice. Paul was willing to make the sacrifice, to lose absolutely everything that was important to him because of his deep love for his people. That sets the tone for what he's about to tell them. Now remember there are two reasons that Paul is writing the letter of Romans. Number one is to introduce himself because he wants to come and visit them and he wants them to know who he is when he comes. What was number two? Anybody remember? The conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews have been kicked out of Rome. The, Gen the Jews thought that while they were gone, the church would die. The church actually flourishes while they're gone. The church among the Gentiles continues to grow. The Jews come back into town, and now the Jews are saying, how could you grow when you're gone? You need us. And the Gentiles are saying, we don't need you. Go away again. And Paul is writing to address this conflict. So this, this section is speaking very powerfully to this discussion between the Jews and the Gentiles. He's telling them the Jews are very important. And Gentiles, even though, even though you may think that they're not, I love these guys to the point that I'm willing to give everything for them. Then he says this, they are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed His glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them His law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping Him and receiving His wonderful promises. When I read this this morning, um, I'm used to reading this passage and I've been reading this week, um, kind of looking forward to tonight and, and the message next week. And I didn't catch this week what Paul viewed as being so important about the Jewish people. Because what he views as being the most important is, and the reason that they're important, is because God chose them to be his adopted children. He had revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them. He gave them his law, gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Now I want us to ask the question, have we been given all of those things? Did Jesus not make it possible for us to be God's adopted children? Mm -hmm. Has he not revealed his glory to us? Mm -hmm. Has he not given us his law? Has he not made covenants with us? Has he not given us the privilege of worshiping him and of receiving his wonderful promises? Yeah, he has. Has he not offered this to everyone? Yeah, he now has. We see the passion that Paul had to see people reach for Christ. Should we not take the gospel message just as seriously? I want you set on that. <laughs> Hopefully it troubles you too. Um, he then continues his discussion on, uh, on the Jews. Um, he talks about uh, the fact that being descendants of Abraham doesn't truly make you Abraham's children. Um, only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. This is a really hard section. When Isaac married Rebecca, he, she gave birth to twins. Verse 10, verse 11. Before they were born and before they had done anything good or bad, she, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chose, 
chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of scriptures, I have loved Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. For it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have anointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God cho chooses to show mercy to some, and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so that they refuse to listen. Does that trouble anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It troubles me. And one of the things that, that we have to keep in mind as we read this, um, in the Nazarene Church, our view of Scripture is we do not take one verse of Scripture and build a theology on that one verse of Scripture. We look at the whole message of Scripture. There are going to be times when we look at Scripture and we say, that just doesn't line up with what you said over here. And that's where we understand that these are divinely inspired documents, but they're also human documents. And Paul is writing, at this point, in a lot of pain. Have you ever received a letter from somebody that was really hurting? And they wrote this letter to you and some of the things that they said didn't make a whole lot of sense or they were very hurtful or you didn't understand them? Paul was writing this portion of this letter in a lot of pain. He's recognizing this is hard. He he's said, I'm willing to, have, to lose everything. And then he starts to address these issues that are hard issues. And the truth is, when we read this, we recognize that God is indeed God. He does not operate on this the same scale that we operate on. He does not operate under the same um, authority that we operate under. And there's sometimes when we have to look at God and say, you know what, God, you're God, we're not. We don't understand, but our concern is to do what we need to do. Paul continues, um, <clears throat> You might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? No, don't say that. And here's the kicker. Who are you? A mere human being to argue with God. Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use one lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he's very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Um, this... This speaks to the fact that it is not ours to understand these issues. But he also comes back to the concept that he's kind of explained earlier and the concept that he's going to explain later, that everybody had the same chance, but some people rejected. And because of their rejecting, and, and I mentioned the, the first night on Romans, John Wesley's statement on this, and I, I didn't bring the full PowerPoint, I should have, um, but the summation of it is, God has the right to establish the criteria for receiving his salvation. And he has the right to reject those who do not accept it on his terms. If I were offering a million dollar gift to someone, not gift, but a million dollars to someone who would meet step one, two, three, four, five... I have the right to set that step one, two, three, four, five, right? Because it's my money that I'm giving away. Okay. And I have the right to tell anyone that, no, I'm sorry, you don't meet the criteria because I'm the one giving it away. How many of you have looked at um, 
like the game pieces for McDonald's and the list of legal ease that they have to write because somebody's going to sue them for not winning the game. We don't live in, our culture does not play very well by the rules. Our culture believes that everybody should get what we want. And what Paul is saying here, and it's hard, what Paul is saying here is God is God and God sets the rules. And we may not understand it, but it's not ours to understand. And it is not ours to say to God, you can't do that, that's not fair, because who is, we're creation. What is our, why do we think that as creation we have the right to tell the Creator what to do? Um, this is the, the, the part of Romans that I have been dreading. <laughs> because it troubles me every time I read it. And I really don't have a good answer for it. But as we, as we read through this, we recognize that we do not build our theology based on one section of Scripture. We build it on the overarching theme. And the overarching message of Scripture is definitely that salvation is available to all. In fact, Paul has said that salvation is available to all. He said it in what... Uh, um, well, and right before what uh, what Larry preached on this morning, um, chapter eleven, verse or chapter ten, verse five, for Moses writes that that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it said the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your hearts. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are, being, are, that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the Scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe? And how can they believe if they've not heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? You see, it's very clear here that this message is offered to everyone. But some choose to reject and some choose to accept. Right? We see that here. So when Pharaoh failed, he had the opportunity Pharaoh apparently and, had the opportunity. But God knew that he was going to be, wasn't going to do it. So, yeah. that, That's what we think. And some of the commentaries that I read on this had some interesting perspectives. First of all, hardness of heart is not a life sentence. No. Recognize that. It may be that God hardened their hearts, but not forever. How many of us have gone through stages where we've been, had hard hearts? Mm -hmm. yeah, we still I, had that free will. Yeah, we, we've all gone through those, those stages. But that's not a life sentence. We have the opportunity to, to, to receive forgiveness later on. Um, so there's a, there's a lot in this that I don't fully understand, and, and I don't think we will understand until we get to the other side of it. But I want us to also recognize that even though there's some parts of this that we don't understand, there's a whole lot of it that we do understand. And... Sometimes when we're reading Scripture, we get stuck on what we don't understand instead of applying what we do understand. And what Paul has to say in the passages that follow this, um, especially in, in chapter 12, is, is a pretty, some pretty powerful stuff. And I want us to, to kind of shift from, from chapter, uh, chapters 9 through 11, which is focusing on Israel. Let's now focus on... Um, actually, I, I want us to look at chapter 11, too, because there's some, some more interesting stuff here. And I say interesting in a very sarcastic way. Um, did God's people, starting in verse 11 of chapter 11, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made a salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world, will, the world will share when they finally accept it. I'm saying this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles, and I stress this. 
For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so that I might save some of them. Now when you're in middle school and high school and you're trying to get somebody's attention, sometimes you'll, you'll play hard to get or you'll act like you're with somebody else to get their attention. You remember playing those games when you were in school. And that's the concept, and, and this is troubling as well, that, that Paul presents here. God is allowing the Gentiles to be saved because he wants the Jews to be jealous. Hey, look at what they've got. See how good it is? The interesting thing is that the reason that God chose the Jewish nation was not so that they could be special and pat themselves on the back, but so that the rest of the world could see what it was for their nation to have a God like this. He planted their nation right in the middle of the, of the trading crossroads because he wanted everyone to go through Israel and see what an awesome God they have. So what we see here is we see that that on one hand, God is trying to use the Gentiles to make the Jews see what who he is. And on the other hand, God is trying to use the Jews to see if the Gentiles to see who he is. The important piece of this is God wants us all to see who he is. And he knows our human nature because he created us. That sometimes we have to be a little bit jealous in order to truly see what we have what is available to us. So don't think, he's then he starts talking to the uh, Gentiles again. Verse 21. Verse 20, 21. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For God did not spare the original branches, and he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You by nature were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. He uses a pretty big word there, mystery. And he sums up, I mean, this kind of wraps up this, this section. It's a mystery. What, is, what does it mean for something to be a mystery? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> it means that we're not going to understand all the details of it. Um, so we understand that, and... Don't feel proud that you are saved. I mean, that's not a source of pride. Our salvation is the reality of God's grace being extended to us as worthless sinners. It's not something that we're proud of. It's not something that we say, oh, I'm saved. It's something that we needed to be saved. We needed a Savior, and we recognize the humility of that. It doesn't make us better than anybody else. It does not make us better than anybody else. We've just... We've had the unnatural thing happen of God being willing to graft us into history. Even though we did not deserve it, we clearly did not deserve it. Um, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Probably the most quoted verses from Romans. Mm -hmm. Definitely my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, Judy, your mom shared last week, these are her favorite verses. In the New Living Translation, uh, this puts us a little bit differently. And it says the same thing, but it's, it puts it in a way that's had me thinking. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Listen closely, you might have heard this before. Don't think that you are better than you really are. Isn't that what he just said? Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. In other words, don't measure yourself compared to everybody else. I'm not better than anybody else in this room. 
I don't say, let's see here. Yeah, I'm better at this and so and so. I'm better at this and so and so. No. We measure ourselves not against anyone else, but against the question of how are we doing with what God has given us. The evaluation that matters of me is am I using well the resources, the talents, the abilities that God has given me? None of those things are my own. None of those things do I take pride in and say, I'm just special. All of these things are reflections of God. He has given these gifts to us. And the questions that we ask is, how are we doing with what God has given us? Jesus addressed this in his parable of the talents. Oh, that one keeps me up at night. Are we investing wisely what he has given us? Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. With my red pen, I came in here and I just underlined the, uh, the first parts of these questions. So if God has given you, if your gift is, if you are a, if you, your gift is, if it is, if God has given you, and if you have a gift for, you see what's, not, what's important is the fact that God has given each one of us something. Not what, because there's... Each of us have different gifts. The question is, God has given each one of us, are we using that, what he's given us well? And this is where I'm going to be boring myself for the next three years. I'm going to write a 200-page paper on this. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you think that God gives you the talent and tells you to use it the way it should be used? He does, and he constantly refines us in that process. It's not like he just says, you know, here's this, go use it. But he, he gets, says, I've given you this gift, let me shape this gift in you. And he's given every one of us a gift, and a different gift. We, we recognize that we have to have different gifts in order for us to function as a body. <clears throat> My thumb... It's a pretty important part of my body, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard to open anything if you don't have a thumb. You ever cut your thumb and not been able to use it? Mm. It's a very important part of my body. But you know what? I can't hear a thing out of my thumb. <laughs> I can't see a thing out of my thumb. I can't taste a thing with my thumb. But yet, it's pretty important. My eyes are pretty important as well. But you know what? I can't hear a thing out of my eyes. I can't touch a thing with my eyes without them hurting profusely. I can't smell anything with my eyes. Every part has its function. The problem is if my thumb thinks it's supposed to be an eye. The problem comes in if my eye thinks it's supposed to be an ear. You go around telling your doctor that, you're going to end up with a very special jacket. <laughs> if, he gives you a gift, if he gives you a gift, and you don't use the gift the way you're supposed to use the gift, he can condemn you on that, right? Right. Because he created us to use our gifts. He called us to use them. And here's the thing. This is the that thing that I'm thinking about at 3 o'clock in the morning. God created us in his image. Genesis tells us that clearly. He created man in the image of God. My gifts reflect the image of God. But my gifts alone do not solely reflect the image of God. Meaning, just Emmanuel does not reflect the image of God. But my gifts combined with everyone else's gifts, combined to reflect the image of God. 
You see, we can only reflect him when we're all working together using what we've been given. There's a couple of places, and I think in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions this in, uh, in the letter to the Hebrews, it is mentioned, um, the concept of the temple. The temple reflects the God, correct? Right. In that culture, when you went to a city, every city had a temple to some God, and you would look at that temple to determine what you thought of their God. Now around A.D. 70, the temple in Jerusalem, the temple to God, was torn down. That was very troubling. Now, how did, they, how did the Jews explain to people who their God was? Because there was no temple to say, this is what our God is. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, and the author to the Hebrews says the same thing in, in chapter, I think it's the end of chapter 11. The temple is not a building. The temple is us. Mm -hmm. But not just me. Us collectively. He uses a southern term of all y'all. That's what the <laughs> Greek says. <laughs> all y'all. It's, it's, it's all of us together. The collective you that reflects the image of God. This concept of giving our bodies as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and pure. It's not just to say, I climbed up on the altar and I died. It's to say, I'm giving my life and you're giving your life and together we're giving our lives and because we're living as sacrifices, God is doing something awesome in all of us. That fly is really annoying. Yes. <laughs> okay. You'll hear more of that on Sunday. I'll move on. Um, respect for authority. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Um, pretty uh, straightforward section. One that, uh, when we read it today, we say... Yeah, but you don't know how corrupt the U.S. government is. But he would say the U.S. government is pretty transparent and pretty, pretty good compared to the Roman government. Remember why the tax collectors were so hated? Because they could set their own taxes. And if you looked at them wrong, they could raise your taxes. King James. And everybody hated them because of that. The Roman government system was absolutely corrupt, and you could put someone to death simply because you didn't like them. In America, at least they get a trial. Now, they could get a corrupt judge, they could get corrupt lawyers, they could t um, contaminate the jury pool, and they could get someone convicted, but it's a lot harder than it was then. So, <clears throat> we may have excuses as to why we think we shouldn't respect the government. Paul is saying we really don't have an excuse. You may not like them, but I'll tell you what the Christians did in this era. They did not get picket signs. They did not boycott the government. They did not write letters to their senators. They lived out Christianity. And in their truly, authentically, genuinely living out Christianity... In a very short period of time, over 50% of the Roman Empire had gotten saved. What percentage of gain is the church seeing in America today? Are we going the other way? Yeah, we are. Because we're doing all these things. We're picketing, we're writing letters to our senators, we're doing all this stuff. But we're not genuinely living out discipleship. And as a result, we're not even keeping up with population growth. We're losing 70% of young adults in the church today. And no legislation that is passed can change that. The answer for the church is not to get more freedom to put prayer back into schools. Because the sad truth is, we don't pray in our churches. Why do we care about the schools? The answer for the church 
is that we live out what it means to be a disciple. And if we do that, we're going to see the results that we want to see abundantly. And it may not change government, but we're going to see our investments going the right way. And we're really not going to care because of what we see God doing. That 50% of the Roman Empire that got saved, that was when it was illegal to be a Christian if they found out, if the governing authorities found out they could have you killed simply because you were a Christian. The answer for the church, the responsibility of the church, is not to try to get government to do what we want. It is to live out what God says we <coughs> live out. Um, chapter 14. The danger of criticism. Anybody in this room ever been hurt by someone criticizing them? Mm-hmm. Every one of us. Paul makes some pretty big statements here. Accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person thinks it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain food must not condemn those who do. For God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Why would it mention vegetarians in here? Any clue? Is that because of the sacrifices given to idols? Mm-hmm. That they didn't want to eat any of the meat that had been mm-hmm. sacrificed to an idol? Right. Bob, where do you get your meat at IB? We get it at uh, IBP. Okay. What's IBP? Uh, At the level of being processors. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a place that you make orders from. They kill accordingly and send you meat. In this culture, I mentioned the temple. Everybody knew who God was based on the temple. You see, here's the deal. Some people would raise animals and um, kill them, bring them into the market, sell the meat. That's the way you do it. But if you wanted cheap meat that was just as good, every day, in every temple, there were a multitude of sacrifices that were made. Part of the meat that was from the animals that were sacrificed was used in the, in the offering. They would burn part of it before the God as an offering. And part of it, as a gift from the God, would then be taken into the marketplace and sold at a discounted price. You could go to this guy, pay, pay full price, or you could go over here and pay half price, It's a gift from the God. Now the problem is that people were afraid to eat meat because they didn't know if it was meat that had been offered as a sacrifice or whether it was meat that had been killed legitimately. And Paul is saying here, you know what, it really doesn't matter. But don't argue about it. Because some people have a sensitive conscience, they're afraid of of eating the wrong meat. Don't tell them they're wrong. Don't argue with them about it. Let God deal with that with them. Because if we try to tell them they're wrong, then we've just, we've lost the battle. Stumbling block. You're becoming a stumbling block. He addresses that here in a little bit. It's not our responsibility to tell everyone how wrong they are. It's our responsibility to follow God, to love there are some things that, in, and Scripture lays out a, a way that some things have to be addressed. But if it's not a, a major issue, we don't argue and we don't condemn people over little things. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to let God judge and we do what we're supposed to do. This concept of criticism is probably the reason that most people are not in the church today. I would say maybe 5 to 10% of the, of the culture population are atheists. They don't believe in God. 73% of Americans claim to be Christians. And yet less than 20% are actually active in the church. Where's the other 50% at? 
They're tired of being criticized. And here's the thing. I have a, the professor that I have right now is a, a retired, um, I don't know what his rank was in the, in the Army, but he's, he has the mentality of a drill sergeant. And every paper that he receives, and we had some nice discussion about this yesterday, every paper that he receives, he has it in his mind before he, grades the paper, before he reads it, he's not going to read the whole thing. He's going to find as many mistakes as he can, as quickly as he can, and stop reading as soon as he can, and kick it back to us and tell us to rewrite it. Because he's trying to transition us from casual writing, which is what we're used to, to a scholarly writing, which is what is necessary to write the dissertation, the 200-page paper. So he has it in his mind that he is going to kick this back to everybody. We have one lady in the cohort ahead of us who was an editor at a, I think, Nazarene publishing house, but a very large publishing house. She makes her money making sure that things are done right. He kicked her papers back. <laughs> and the, the thing is, um, when, when he kicked my first paper back, there were five typos in what he kicked back. I mean, he, he blatant words run together. I mean, I made stupid mistakes by, in, in scholarly writing, you only put one space between after a period instead of two spaces. Um, those were my mistakes, and he had run words together, misspelled words. Kind of. That irritated me. Now, I knew that I was wrong, and I knew that he was going to keep my paper back. But I was distracted by that because of his typos. The world knows that it's sinful. They know that they need God. But they're distracted by our hypocrisy because we're arguing over stuff that doesn't matter. And we're hurting people instead of paying attention to what does matter. And they can't see their need for God. And they can't see who God is because they're so distracted by our hypocrisy. This is a very powerful section. And I pray that as you read it, you read it carefully. It's probably one that you need to read a couple times. Chapter 15. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. Hmm. How does that go over in this culture? <laughs> we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. The, such things were written... In scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Um, this concept of living to please others is also devastating, isn't it? How much of what we do, we do we do for others? How many of us actually buy clothes that we like compared to what we think is acceptable in the culture today? Isn't that a good question? I mean, the, the entire clothing industry is based on the fact that we're buying clothes based on what we think is going to look good. Not to us, but to those that, we're, that see us. How many million, billions of dollars are spent on clothing every year? It's all based on what others think of us. You recognize this? We do so many things not based on what we need or what we should do, but based on what we think other people are going to say about us. Now, in high school, we make stupid mistakes. We do things because other people are doing it. As adults, we spend money. We waste money on stuff because other people are doing it or because we think that they're doing it. That's another very powerful section. Um, Paul's reading for, reason for writing. He again reminds them of why he's writing, tells them his travel plans. He's planning on coming to see them. Then we're actually getting into the next week's reading uh, in chapter 16, but I'm going to cover it tonight because next week we'll be covering 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Paul greets his friends. Um, he has some friends in, uh, in Rome. He starts out by saying, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church in Centuria. Uh, welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of, of honor among God's people. 
She's the mail lady. She's the one coming with the letter. So she's traveling for some reason from Corinth to Rome. And so she carries this letter with her as she travels. In verse uh, 22, I, Tertius, the one writing this letter for Paul, send my greetings too. So we recognize that Phoebe is the one who carries the letter. Tertius is the one who actually wrote the letter. Paul didn't write it. Paul spoke it. Tertius wrote it down. Verse 3, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I'm thankful for them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Priscilla and Aquila were among the Jews who were kicked out of Rome when the Roman, when the Jews were fighting, the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews were fighting. Um, they, when they were kicked out, they went to Corinth. Paul met them in Corinth. Paul then took them to Ephesus. They did work for Paul in Ephesus. And then after they were Jews were allowed back into Rome, they headed back to Rome. Priscilla and Aquila are most likely the reason that Paul is writing to address the conflict that's taking place, because he would have heard from them, Paul, you will not believe what we came home to. Let us tell you about the squabbles that are taking place. Would you please help us? Because somebody needs to address the situation. Um, verse 13, Greet Rufus whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, whom has been a mother to me. Who's Rufus? When there's a name there, it usually means something. It means that the people who were reading it knew who Rufus was. Um, turn to Gospel of Mark with me. Chapter 15. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. The soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. What verse is that? Verse 21 of chapter 15. Paul is addressing, or, or uh, Mark is writing this letter to Christians in Rome. He's writing down Peter's words, and the people there would know Alexander and Rufus. So he's writing this letter, and he's telling them, guys, this guy that carried the cross, that's Rufus's dad. What this tells us is that that had an impact on, on, on uh, Simon. Because his sons are now members of the church. In fact, the church history tells us that Alexander was one of the first martyrs in Rome. So the reason that Paul only addresses Rufus and not Alexander is because Alexander had been killed for being a Christian. Okay? There's something about what Paul says, though. He says, And greet also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Now, how did Paul get to spend time with this guy named Simon's family? Is that a fair question? Because was Paul there at the crucifixion? Mm -mm. No. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Chapter 13. Actually, verse, chapter 11, verse 19 first. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to the Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles. Some of the Christians, or disciples, from Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles. Now, who could have been from Cyrene? What about Simon? <laughs> Chapter 13. Among the prophets and teachers of the church in Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene. Now, where is Cyrene located? Hmm? 
Anybody know? It's in Africa. Oh, you said that once. <laughs> Just check and see if anybody remembers what I said a little bit more. Cyrene was in Africa. So Simeon, and, and you'll see frequently in Scripture that one person will write a person's name one way and another person will write it another way because they didn't have, they couldn't just look it up in Google to see how they spell their name or look it up on Facebook like I do. If I'm writing a card to someone, I look on Facebook to see how do they spell their name. Um, when I fill out baby dedication certificates, that's where I go to check. Um, so Simeon, or Simon, called the black man, next to Lucius, probably both of them were from Cyrene. Now, Barnabas and Saul were in um, Syria together for over a, a year before Saul was sent on his missionary journey. So during that time, it appears, when Saul was brought there, he didn't have any family. And this man, Simon, his family took Paul in, treated him like a son. And then after... Saul went on his journeys. At least Rufus and Alexander ended up heading to Rome. So that Peter or Paul, Peter would mention, and that Mark would write down in the book of Mark, that this was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And the legend tells us that Alexander was martyred in Rome. And when Paul is writing his letter to Rome, he said, Greet Rufus for me. And also his dear mother, because his, dear, his mother has been like a mother to me. Now that's just a list of names, but I think it's very interesting to see how the Christian world grew and to see how these relationships were built over time. Um, what we're going to read this week is, aside from the, the first section that's going to be extremely troubling, is going to be more practical. Um, this is what it means to live out Christianity. So I encourage you to read that and, uh, and take it to heart, obey it. It's probably going to be some, some slaps across the face as the Lord says, you need to look at this. I definitely have been receiving some of those as I have been reading through this. So it kind of gives you a, a perspective. Any questions? Okay. Well, next week we will... Uh, introduce 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians, it comes first in the, the letters of the church, to the churches that Paul planted um, because it's the longest. But it's not the nicest letter that Paul wrote. It's not the, rude, the, the most rude, but it's not the nicest one. We'll have some fun with that next week. Well, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us and thank you for your word. Help us to fall deeply in love with your word. And may it impact us deeply. May we live what we read. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.